This episode of the podcast is brought to you by KC Consulting. Have your cannabis brand social media accounts been shut down by Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube for violating their quote unquote community guidelines? Do you ever feel overwhelmed by having to continually create new content, then share that content to a targeted audience while responding to incoming comments and questions? When your marketing plans or lack thereof seem too daunting and overwhelming, it's important to have a trusted digital marketing partner to ensure your social media presence is healthy and active. KC Consulting is a premier social media marketing agency based in Dallas, Texas that specializes in strategy, content creation, channel management, paid advertising, graphic design, and SEO services that will take your social media marketing efforts to the next level. The agency is hyper-focused on helping cannabis companies navigate through the uncharted waters that they've been forced to endure due to the lack of FDA regulation in regards to sales and marketing messaging. Give them a call today to schedule a free consultation at 972-310-7474 or shoot them an email at social at kcconsulting.co. Don't take on the burden of managing your social media channels alone. Instead, take your social media marketing efforts to the next level with KC Consulting. Add value, not noise. KC Consulting. Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect podcast, your favorite podcast that includes industry-facing conversations with the industry's leading experts that aim to educate and inform the public regarding the plant's endless benefits. My guest today is Len May. He's the CEO at Endocana Health. Len May, what's going on, man? All good. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, it's my I'm first excited. one of the day. I usually have like back to back ones, but today is uh, this is my first one, so I'm, I'm yeah, I'm fresh. You're a yeah, you're a you're a, a veteran podcaster. Don't you have your own podcast and do a lot of I, these? I do. Yeah, it's called Everything Is Personal because everything is personal, isn't it? That's right. I totally agree with that. When did you start Everything Is Personal? Yeah, we started that in I think we started in October of uh, last year. So here's the thing. You know, I, I used to travel all over the world and speak at events. Obviously, with COVID, you can't do that anymore. And the funny thing is, so I, I was interviewed by uh, who's now my co-host and, and friend several years ago, uh, John Small for a Green Entrepreneur, and we talked for like 20 minutes. And he's like, uh, and we then we got into music because we're both music guys, and we started talking about music, and we're actually like old old school hip hop fans too. Nice. So it's like two two white guys talking about old school <laughs> hip hop. It's kind of interesting. But anyway, so he reached out to me about a podcast. And I was like, yeah, you know, what are we going to talk about? It's like the same shit that we talk about on the phone all the time. Who cares if people are interested in it? So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of the flow of the podcast. It's, uh, you know, we talk about music. We talk about cannabis. We talk some science stuff, just, you know, stuff. And then guests started coming on. So we just had a uh, be real from Cypress Hill on, which I, which I, I was like a fanboy of. Because <laughs> that was my biggest. Yeah. That was my biggest. I know we have doctors, we have scientists, we have all kinds of people, but that one for me was it. So I apologize to all the other guests. Anyway. No, I get it, man. Yeah, be real is the man, and he's he's you know really done a lot um, for the industry. He's and he's yeah. pushing out a lot of content on the daily, you know. For sure. Uh, sure. in support of cannabis and all that so that's so cool and and don't you like notice that as you kind of continue to do this you meet with more guests like you almost get better at conversations too and like listening and you know the back and forth seems a bit smoother yeah i i, I definitely think that the more you do it the more it becomes a natural thing like at first like, hey, you know you're talking on camera but uh listening and not interrupting is still something I'm trying to get used to because <laughs> I have a thought. I have ADD. So when a thought comes in, man, I got to pop it out or else it's gone. So I'm trying to get better at that. Sure. Yeah. No. And you know what? A little uh, little tip or life hack that helped me. So with Zoom, you know how you have the different gallery and speaker views? I've just seen that the speaker view helps because it it makes you pause you know, mm-hmm. until you see the other person respond and then the, you know, the screen flips to them. So um, I don't know, I, that seemed to help because I, I, I see the same challenge. So cool, Good man. Point. Well, I'm definitely going to have to check that out. And everyone listening, uh, everything's personal or it's personal. Everything is personal. Everything yep. is personal. Everything. Check it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Well, so 
Len, I'm I'm really excited and interested to talk to you today because several times on Cannabinoid Connect, this notion of the future of medicine comes up, right? Mm -hmm. And we get excited because we know that we're just scratching the surface when it comes to uh, all the different major minor cannabinoids that we know about in the plant. And it's very mm -hmm. limited right now because there's over 150 or 20, I think, or something like that. But around 500. 500. See, so yeah. that's that's a new number that, that, <laughs> that I've even. So there you go. You taught me something right away. And so. Right. As we're scratching service, we're learning about the efficacy of, and the therapeutic value of these cannabinoids. Um, we get excited about that future medicine, uh, medicine concept because mm -hmm. we're going to be able to dial in uh, when we have a clear understanding, like what, you know, what particular cannabinoid helps with what particular ailment. And yeah. it seems as though endocanna health is like light years ahead of like where we're at now and you're positioning yourself, you know, for of course now and the future by right. actually doing that, like providing a roadmap for people to understand which cannabinoids best interact with the endocannabinoid system and yeah. their CB1 and CB2 receptors. So let's start there. Tell us yeah. a little bit about, you know, your background and the company. Yeah. So, uh, and I appreciate you, you putting it out like that because I used to play hockey when I was a kid. So Gr Wayne Gretzky was my big uh, like role model. And I love his quote. He's like, and they asked him, how did you score all these goals? He's like, I skate where the puck is going to be. So that's sort of endo. We are anticipating. Yeah, there's some things that we may be a little bit ahead of the industry on, but it's fine. I'd rather be ahead than behind. Um, so my background a little bit, I was, uh, I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, when I was a kid, I was kind of that kid that stayed in class and uh, I would drift, my mind would drift. I was smart, but I was like, you know, not interested. And I was diagnosed with ADD. So I was put on all kinds of prescription medication for that. And I was lucky enough that I met these older kids that asked me if I want to share a cigarette. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll be that cool kid, shares a cigarette. And uh, took a drag, inhaled, and it wasn't, wasn't a cigarette. It was filled with uh, cannabis. Uh, weed. <laughs> they tricked you. <laughs> they, they tricked me, yeah, which I'm grateful for because I wouldn't have had that experience. And I went back to class and I went back to class, like the windows that you can see like on your computer open, that's my head. So it started shrinking and I could start focusing. I'm like, wow, man, that is my medicine. So from there, you know, my, my parents caught me many times. I stopped taking all kinds of medication. I just took cannabis as my go-to. And uh, they ended up kicking me out of the house, actually calling the cops on me uh, to try to get me arrested because my dad, old school, Eastern European is like cannabis and heroin are the same thing. Right. Not. The yeah. irony of that is they consume formulations that I, I made now for their aches and pains and other things. But um, from there, I became an activist. I was uh, the president of the Cannabis Action Network. So I'm old. So I held a rally at an Independence Hall in Philadelphia where the Constitution and Declaration of Independence is, by the way, all on hemp paper. And uh, that was back in 1993. So I was like, yeah, man, you know, it's going to be legal. And you know, it wasn't legal for many, many years after that. Right. But, uh, ended up moving to LA and got into the dispensary space because my overall goal is the therapeutic properties of plants. So I thought through a dispensary, I can try to treat as many, you know, patients at that time as possible. And which... Uh, you know, it sort of was like that, but then, you know, patients, not everybody has an ailment per se, which is fine. And then the other thing that I started seeing is two people with the same exact symptomatic condition would consume the same chemovar or strain as uh, people will refer to, and they would have a completely different experience. So that's where my hyper-focus came in again. I was like, shit, it's got to be something with the plant because people bring in strains and like, what is that blue dream? Okay, it's blue dream. Slap a label on it, it's blue dream. Well, anyway, I met a, a um, I started, I saw a video by a guy named Kevin McKernan, who's one of the first people to genetically sequence cannabis. And long story short, I started working with them. They taught me how to sequence and extract DNA and all that. So I would go travel around the US, get samples of plant material, bring it to my lab, extract the DNA, purify it, send it to uh, Boston to a sequencer, and we started a genetic library called Canopedia. Uh, so you would take five blue dreams, you would sequence them, two of them are identical, two are somewhere related, and the fifth one is not even close. So yeah, 
and, and to pause you there, like when you talk about Blue Dream and the sequencing and just trying to figure out which are identical and what are some, yeah. um, you know, variables or differences between the others, mm -hmm. it, that is mainly to do with the secondary compounds such as like the terpenes and the flavonoids, right? It, it's both. So it's, it's the cannabinoids, the terpenes, they're the main components of the plant. So the, you have the genetics of the plant, which are the, all the cannabinoids, and then you have... Uh, you have the, the terpene profile as well. So the cannabinoids, all the components of the plant should be identical. So you have sort of your control and then you sequence against that control like you would do in any kind of study. And then you use uh, PCR technology to be able to guide you in that process. So you can see as you're building a library, you can see that these come up identical uh, or within, within a certain uh, uh, variable because up the plant is never identical. You always have genetic drift. That's another, uh, you know, conversation for having formulations. If we're going to move into the out of the dark ages with this, we have to be consistent. And for a plant, it's very difficult to be consistent unless you're doing like tissue culture sample, etc., because you always have genetic drift. The further you are away from the seed, the more genetic drift you have. Also, the plant is interesting in this in the way that it responds to stress. Now, some of the stress can respond positively. The the expression of terpenes which are the essential oils of the plant, they're expressed under stress. We as cultivators, I'm not a cultivator, but I'm just talking in generalities, we stress the plant at a certain point so it expresses its full potential. However, we can make mistakes in that plant, and then the curing process is another way to be able to get all those terpenes out. So the concept of this plant working together with the cannabinoids and terpenes and, and flavonoids uh, to some extent, those actually create the experience. So you have the DNA of the plant, as I mentioned, like, you know, somewhere around 500 different components. We don't even know what a lot of them are, but we can pick them up on different technology. They work in concert with your DNA, and that's where you can have a personal experience. So I, I kind of flipped it uh, in the beginning. There's a part of the story that I really want to focus on where we had a meeting at Harvard Medical School with a bunch of uh, physicians that were treating kids with epilepsy using CBD. And uh, they were having, a lot of them were having success. They go home from a hundred seizures to zero, but some of them had outliers. So kids, uh, the seizures either would come back or it wasn't working for them. Mm -hmm. So we uh, genetically sequenced the human side, uh, pharmacogenomics, and we saw that they had biomarkers in common, which were for a specific type of epilepsy, which is called Dravet syndrome. And we published on that. And when we published on that, we saw sort of uh, GW Pharmaceutical take a turn. They were pushing Sativax, uh, which was the product they were trying to get past the FDA. And I think they started focusing on Epidiolex because you can home in a lot more on a specific biomarker. And that's when I had my aha moment. I was like, well, if there's one biomarker, maybe there's more. And they really didn't have an interest in that, which is fine. They wouldn't focus on the plant, which is what they're doing. And that gave me an opportunity to launch Endo. And that's the very first thing we did for the first six, seven months is research. We looked at every single SNP that had a direct or indirect association with the endocannabinoid system. And you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, we we're talking about the plant, but it starts with the endocannabinoid system. And then you look, you look at the phytocannabinoids that can subsidize what you're missing endogenously. But it's not only that. It's your mental state, your nutrition, all these different things, because you have this amazing regulatory system and you want to feed it correctly. So it does what it's supposed to do, which is be that puppet master, be that ultimate regulator. And that's kind of how we launched. You know, and, and that analogy, I mean, so you said, I mean, there's a lot to unpack and I want to just go back to the first analogy because it kind of sets the stage for everything. And that is that mm -hmm. Wayne Gretzky, you know, analogy where you said you want to be not where the puck's at, but where the puck is going to end gonna up be. or going to yeah. be, right? Yeah. And so I, I, if I'm thinking about this and I'm closing my eyes and I'm picturing it, you, you've got you guys at the end by the finish line, you know, trying to, you're, you're starting first with the endocannabinoid system and right. you're working our way back. And then you've got all these companies that are just like, you know, finding different formulations and innovations and different ways in which we can consume the, the plant and the, the various cannabinoids. Right. But then in the middle of all that, there's this education factor, right. For, mm -hmm. for both the policymakers and for the, the healthcare system. Right. So 
like, wow, you guys are so far ahead of it. Like, does any of your business model incorporate education when it comes to these broader um, entities and, and groups? Like I said, like the, the policymakers in the healthcare system, or is that just going to kind of figure itself out, out and you guys are just full sprint ahead on the science side? Yeah, no, education is key. And man, it's like, it's, it's always an education for me too, because like yesterday I had a conversation with a physician, with a doctor. And I was going over the report and he asked me what a variant is. I was like, oh, I did not know, like doctors should know this stuff, right? And then I had to go to DNA 101. So yes, we, we have to do even a better job. But most of the time we educate and starts with DNA 101. What, how does DNA even work? What is DNA? And, it's, it, and there's, there's DNA and then there's epigenetics. So, I mean, you had a good analogy too, your, your sort of roadmap. So your DNA is like your blueprint. It gives you, uh, it gives you sort of a, a roadmap of what's possible. And then you are in control of being able to turn some of those switches on or off. Some genes, you can't. Some genes we're born with. We get them from our parents and you know our skin color, how tall we're gonna be, our eye color, male pattern baldness like me, all that's locked in. However, certain genes, you have predispositions. So the understanding of your own genetics is really important because you can now take action. And a lot of people used to think, all right, I'm born this way. There's nothing I can do about it. That's not true. You're born with a predisposition and you have the capability and the power to turn that switch on or off by doing certain things. Sometimes we trigger things that we don't want to trigger where there's a, an agonist, sometimes there's an antagonist. So on and off is really important. But without you knowing that, you're sort of driving blindly. And uh, you know the, the idea is to understand what it is that you have potential for, consume what's right for you, and then check epigenetically, which is what the expression of those are, what is going on. And, and scientific research has been stunted for many, many reasons uh, political reasons, well, pharmaceutical, all that kind of stuff in the cannabis space. But we have the best research in the world, which is anecdotal research, which is you and I take something and we say, I feel great from this. And you say, not for me. Well, great. So we combine that information. There's nothing better than that. I, you know, science can tell me, you know, you can do rat models, you can do in vitro, in vivo, all that stuff. But when grandma Mary says, man, I tried four different products. This one did this, this one did that. This one worked for me. And now I can consistently align that with her genotype and give somebody else who has the same genotype a very similar suggestion. Now we build data that's really valuable and that's really powerful for the entire industry. Yeah, you know, that is so true. Because you know, when I think about it from my professional perspective in like the marketing side, right? If you're ever wanting to really showcase the, the goodness of the brand and, and all that, you really want to lead with customer testimonials, right? People speaking on behalf of the company. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of a better way for us to move the needle when it comes to the um, efficacy and the medicinal side of cannabis by just putting those testimonials at the forefront, like, like you said, you know, the anecdotal uh, data and evidence that we're hearing because of course due to the regulation we've been hamstringed with with research and studies for quite some time now but you know the people are coming out of the out of the fold and they're they're really starting to talk about how it's benefiting their lives and those are important stories yeah hugely important and the the challenge with testimonials are the fda frowns on them because they're claimy uh, so one of the things we have to be really really careful of how we position a testimonial uh, I've seen many statements from the FDA saying, you know, you have to take down your testimonial. So uh, there, there are guidelines to be able to do that and do that effectively. But at the end of the day, the, the word of mouth, they can't control somebody on social media or somebody saying something, hey, man, I took this and it worked for me. But the, the fine line is some people are paid to say certain things. So do you know if it really was efficacious for them or not? That's why having and anonymized information that looks at genotypes of people, sort of like these buckets, it doesn't have any correlation to Kevin's own personal DNA. It talks about like people that have a similar genetic profile have taken something. 
So it's a lot more anonymous and, and a cleaner way that we think to be able to provide that information instead of having doubt that somebody may have gotten paid for their testimonial or something. Sure. No, no, absolutely. And curating that that data and then, like you said, kind of bucketing it, it with, with similarities within that criteria um, is an effective approach. And, and you mentioned the, the 500 number for the cannabinoids, mm -hmm. right? I'm still like fascinated by that. And so mm -hmm. w within endo can of health, like what are, are there cannabinoids that y'all are discovering that people aren't even talking about right now? Like, yeah. Like so this isn't, this isn't my number. This is uh, a number from a, uh, uh, several different uh, scientists, but last uh, conversation that, or presentation, which is public uh, information from Dr. David Miri uh, out of Israel. They, they call it Deddy, if anybody doesn't know. So uh, he was working on a study using AI to see what models work with uh, specific cancer. So what he was looking at was how to create apoptosis, which is really cell death. And the, what he was discovering is uh, in order to have a success, successful apoptosis, you need three receptor binding sites. So the, the, whatever you're consuming, the phytocannabinoid has to bind to three receptors to have successful apoptosis. And in his presentation, he was saying that they're discovering, and I, I've seen this in labs, components. So they discovered somewhere close to 500 different components that the plant has. They're not necessarily all cannabinoids, uh, major, minor. Uh, they include other uh, properties in the plant. So there could be, we identified, you know, as you were saying, 100 different uh, cannabinoids, 120, uh, 100 and uh, something different terpenes and flavonoids. But together, there's close to somewhere around 500 components. The difficult thing is, how do we know, like, you know, you're, you're looking at pharma, pharma's isolating specific molecules, but you have this amazing plant. How do we know that, and he was doing it in petri dishes, which one of those 500 components actually has a successful receptor binding to the individual so we know how to create apoptosis? It's, it's a maze because you have all these components. It's the amazing. plant has all these components. How do you, and, and if pharma is isolating them, that's a whole different approach. So what we do is our reports are focused on CBD, THC, and, and primary and secondary terpenes. The reason why we do this is not because we don't believe in the efficacy of other minor cannabinoids or either cannabinoids like CBG, which is like the grandfather cannabinoid. There's not enough. We made a decision early on. Everything we do has to have a peer reviewed reference. And because we don't have, and it's something that's used against our industry, we don't have enough studies on minor cannabinoids. We can't point to a study in PubMed on, you know, uh, CBC or anything like that. Now, once the studies become more prevalent, we have AI and it's always ongoing, we will add those minor cannabinoids. So anecdotally, yes, we have some evidence, but we don't report on those. You mentioned the doctor um, from, from Israel, right? What was his name? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. David Miri. Dr. David, David Miri. Daddy. And is Daddy is, sorry. And is he on your team or is that just a, a partner or somebody? No, here? just uh, just uh, somebody that I, I have a lot of respect for. Uh, we do work uh, with uh, our partners in Israel for our formulations, which I'll get into. Uh, and there is a connection, but I have no I have no affiliation with uh, Dr. Mira. I'm just a fan of people around the world that are conducting the right kind of research around this amazing plant. And uh, uh, Daddy happens to be like a, you know a, a big a person who's doing a lot of interesting research in this space. And, and the reason I bring him up is because I, I understand that Israel is one of the only, if not the only country that allows for like human testing of the, the, the cannabinoids. Right. Yep. Um, so in that regard, like, is there any way that y'all can point to that, those studies when it comes to additional mm -hmm. cannabinoids or, Oh yeah, now we point to studies all over the world. We have studies from everywhere. There's a, we're, we're doing two clinical trials right now, uh, you know, one in Australia and one in Israel. We have three observational studies under institutional review boards. Uh, so we, we don't get information just from the US. We get information from everywhere. The way that it works is uh, in terms of studies and references, we use AI uh, to find those studies. 
Those studies get funneled in based on our criteria. Then we have a science board featuring uh, Dr. Ethan Russo, uh, Dr. Chris Spooner, Dr. Mike Tagan, and me, who's the lowest person on the totem pole uh, of that whole thing. And we just added um, Dr. Michelle Weiner uh, to be a medical advisor for us as well. And then uh, what we do is we decide which studies to add, which not to add. So there was a study of you know 20 men between the ages of 30 uh, to 35 who are Asian descent. It's probably going to get thrown out. It's not a strong enough study or something that's done and been. So we have to be really careful which studies we add, and we rate those studies based on is it human, is it in vivo, is it in vitro, and a lot of the studies that we reference are in uh, test tubes and in mouse studies, because that's all we have. So when those studies change, uh, your reports always get updated. So you have lifetime updates. Man, that's a hard hitting uh, lineup you have there in terms of the doctors that you mentioned and, and such a rigorous process. I love that y'all do your due diligence in that way. Like nothing gets passed, you know, without everyone reviewing and agreeing on that particular peer review study, you know, right. um, that's, that's pretty amazing. So speaking of peer review studies, um, you know, we talk a lot about the efficacy, the benefits of the cannabinoids and whatnot, um, mm -hmm. you know, but let's talk about adverse effects, right? Yep. So I personally know of two people um, who have experienced cannabinoid hypermesis syndrome, or in other words, cyclical mm -hmm. vomiting syndrome, right? Where mm -hmm. um, I believe it's kind of triggered by overuse, heavy use, frequent use, and then you know, you're in a position where you're throwing up constantly, your mm -hmm. potassium levels get low, you're, you're dehydrated, and you're mm -hmm. ultimately sent to the hospital, right? Right. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that particular adverse effect and, and maybe some others that others people aren't aware of. Yeah, well, let me just say that the number one reason uh, why we do what we do is to help people avoid adverse events. Uh, that's the goal. And the reason why is because we want people to have an optimal experience with cannabis. Studies have shown that, you know, it takes somewhere between five to eight different products for somebody to try before they find what's right for them. But what happens is if somebody who's a novice or somebody who's been consuming and then consumes something else has an adverse event, and I'll give you a couple examples, they may not go back to cannabis. And also they may tell everybody else around them, you know, don't, don't smoke the devil's lettuce, don't consume the snake oil and all that stuff. That's what we want to avoid. And the reason why is because, you know, cannabis is personal. I mean, it's a personal experience. So adverse events, there's many of them. Uh, there's stress and anxiety. Now there's levels of that. THC is a vasodilator. So what happens is it dilates your blood vessels, your heart pumps faster. And when your heart, heart pumps faster, you have heart palpitations. If you are if you already know you may get that, then it's fine. Oh, all right, my heart's beating a little fast. I'm cool. It's supposed to. However, if you are new to this, your heart starts beating fast, and you also have a genetic predisposition towards anxiety and stress. Now you triggered the genetic predisposition, and now you're having maybe a stressful event of anxiety, like a panic attack. Now it gets even better. Somebody that's a poor metabolizer of THC. So how do you know you're a poor metabolizer of THC? Well, you have something called pharmacokinetics. So there's a series of genes. They're called, uh, if it's really science-y, I apologize for it, but I don't know any other way to explain it. Uh, they're called oh, this is great. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> they're called cytochrome P450. They're a family of uh, genes that are, are responsible for enzymes that help us metabolize different things, foods, drinks, and there are specific ones for metabolizing cannabinoids, specifically THC and CBD. There are different ones. So like, for instance, the one that's responsible for THC is called CYP2C9. So looking at your genetic predisposition to CYP2C9, you can see the different genotypes. Somebody may be a poor metabolizer of THC through the digestive system. So here's a perfect scenario. By the way, this happened many, many times uh, in conversations with people that I had. So somebody is a poor metabolizer. They take an edible, small amount. Maybe they go to a dispensary and they get a 10 milligram, 20 milligram. It doesn't matter. But because they're a poor metabolizer, what happens to them is, number one, 
and and the maybe the person at the dispensary tells them, hey, when you do an edible, your uh, THC is going to be converted to 11 oxyhydroxide, which may, which may be a little more powerful than THC. So be be careful. Okay, which is fair. However, if you are a poor metabolizer, you're going to have a slower onset. It's going to last a lot longer, and it can be from five to 50 times more powerful than THC. So somebody takes that, they have a really powerful experience, and now it's a domino effect. It triggers their gene for anxiety and stress, and also PTSD, which then replays the movie. Oh my God, I, am, I have anxiety, I'm stressed, I'm having a panic attack. Remember when I had a panic, a panic attack three months ago? It's happening again. And now there's another gene called AKT1 associated with psychosis or psychomatic uh, response. So now you actually turn on that psychosis gene and people can have a flat out psychotic episode. Now I'm not saying anything to scare anybody. I don't, because nobody has ever, ever died from cannabis. However, it's an uncomfortable experience and it may be an uncomfortable experience which will prevent you from going back. Now, if you knew in advance that you were a poor metabolizer of THC, you have options. Number one option is don't consume orally. Don't have a, don't eat as and don't eat cannabis. Don't eat THC. That's the carboxylated. You know, consume it uh, sublingually under your tongue or a combustible. You know, we don't we don't recommend or suggest uh, you know smoking cannabis. We have nothing against it. It's just hard to dose and measure. But there's other ways to be able to consume cannabis. So that's number one. And being aware that you have this predisposition, you can then modify how much THC you consume. So don't consume, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 milligrams, consume less, balance it with CBD. And then your terpene profile is the secret sauce. Things that boost dopamine, like limonene, that's not good for people that have this anxiety. Look at linalool, that helps lessen the anxiety that's provoked by THC. So this is the knowledge and power that you would get. Flip side, you know, people that have depressive mood uh, predispositions. So they're consuming the opposite of that as we would relate to like indica dominant hybrids. They're high in mercine. They can actually trigger a depressive state in certain people. Uh, drug interaction, hugely important. I think people don't understand and don't talk about this enough. I had so many conversations with people saying, oh man, I want to get off of my SSRIs, the uh, antidepressants or anti-anxiety medication. And I'm taking, I'm starting to consume cannabis with my SSRI. Well, guess what? Your uh, cannabinoids, including CBD, can actually inhibit the efficacy of your antidepressant. So you, your antidepressant is not functioning correctly because you're taking it together with your cannabinoid. Doesn't mean you can't take it. Speak to your healthcare professional, but it may mean to stagger it. So take your SSRI, wait, and then consume your cannabis. How long do you wait? It depends on what type of metabolizer you are. So if you're a rapid metabolizer, 20, 30 minutes. If you're a poor metabolizer, wait a few hours. So these are all the different factors of having adverse, and some people have predisposed to having some, uh, uh, some other challenges when it comes to different cannabinoids. So these are possible adverse effects. And, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome in a second, uh, and also cyclical vomiting syndrome, which are two different things, by the way. Oh, okay. Uh, but, but people mistake it all the time. CHS gets misdiagnosed all the time. And we're not here to diagnose anybody. We're not doctors. We're not diagnosing anybody. But when people talk about CHS, you know, when they go to a hospital, they go to a doctor, a lot of times they're told they have cyclical vomiting syndrome. By the way, there's a gene for that too. And when that gene gets expressed, it, uh, there's a vagus nerve uh, that is uh, expressed and there is, there is vomiting, abdominal pain and all that stuff. So there's similarities to those uh, for sure. But anyway, uh, cyclical vomiting syndrome is a condition that we're looking at and uh, just completed a observational study under an institution, institutional review board. And I can go into the details of that too, but I'll, I'll pause because I just spewed a lot of information uh, to you. So I want to see <laughs> if you have any questions before I dive into that. I mean, my mind, yeah, you, it, it was great information first off. And I, my mind's just all over the place. Like I'm thinking about just how uneducated we are and to no fault of our own, right? Because of the the, the prohibition that's been in place of like right. just picking up like yeah you know, even in non like if you're buying in the illicit market or if you're even buying in the adult use states like 
we really don't have a full grasp as to every single compound that's in in that particular bud right or flower and then how that corresponds to our own personal endocannabinoid system like when you talk about how some indicas you know may um increase depression in some people and it's just like but you know for, for the average consumer you know like myself who again is not even in an adult use state we're just taking what we can get, you know what I mean? Like, and and I, I do feel the difference with different strains in terms of like the high, I guess, or the um, psych, the psychoactive nature, but you know, the, the knowledge and understanding of inherently my body and how it, how it responds, right. Is, is a whole different ball game, man. And it's, it's just fascinating to me. All right. I got one other one for you to kind of blow your mind and, and uh, here you're absolutely right. We, we as an industry need to do better and we need to understand a, and also these whole things with strains and, and indicas and sativas, like we need to start creating a different lexicon. Dr. Ethan Russo said, why are we calling this amazing plant a strain? A strain refers to a virus. Why we call what it is? It's a chemovar. It's a chemical variety or a cultivar, you know? So we got to change that. And indicas and sativas no longer exist. They haven't existed in so long because we bred all that out. It's about the terpene profile. And if you want to be just as a novice you know, without looking at test results, which everybody throughout the world should test their plants, their flower, make sure there's test results on there. Look for not only heavy metals and pesticides and everything else in there. Look for your cannabinoid profile. Look for your terpene profile and insist that your cultivators, your manufacturers, they test for all that stuff because it's important to know what you're putting in your body. You go to a GNC or a vitamin shop, you're going to buy a supplement. You're going to look at a label. It's going to have everything on it. Why can't we do the same thing with cannabis? It makes total sense. So this is something that we have to do as an industry, but as a novice, without even knowing, your nose knows. So I can go into a dispensary uh, and I can take some flour, I can smell it, and I can tell you, smells peppery. Okay, well, that's high in beta caryophyllin. Smells like lavender. Okay, well, that's linalool. Mm -hmm. Smells citrusy, limony. Uh, smells piney, piney, piney uh, right. you know, all these things, we can empower ourselves with even g- getting better guidance for ourselves to understand what that is. And uh, so I'll give you, I'll give you an example. The reason why I think that, you know, we're, we're doing what we're doing. One of the reasons is because I'm just super curious. You know, my mom always like, I'm the why guy. I'm always asking why, why I'm just curious why. And my mom always told me every single disease has to do with stress. She's like, manage your stress. And she's right. But I'm like, but how? Why? Why does it work? How does it work? So here's the endocannabinoid system, how your pain can be related to stress. So we have, uh, we have endogenous, I, your audience probably knows about the endocannabinoid system. Uh, it knows that we, we produce our own endogenous endocannabinoids. We produce uh, anandamide, we produce 2-AG. Uh, the word uh, anon means bliss. So it's your bliss hormone and it's uh, uh, hypothalamus and there's different parts of your brain that produce anandamide. So this is, this is an example of how it would work if uh, somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're stressed. So you're, when you're stressed about anything, your brain secretes different chemicals. So you have dopamine, you have uh, norepinephrine, you have... Uh, uh, adrenaline, you have cortisol, all that's going into your bloodstream. And now when you realize there's no line chasing the jungle, your brain starts releasing an andamite because the goal of the uh, endocannabinoid system to get you back to balance, homeostasis. You can't walk around stress all the time. So there is a gene uh, that produces a, an enzyme. That gene is a SNP called FA, F-A-A-H that produces an enzyme that breaks down an andamide. So this is the thing, think about it this way. Think about a Pac-Man eating an andamide. So the more FOD that you have, the less an andamide you have. You can tell based on a genotype if somebody has more FOD. In that case, they're prone to more stress. Now this is where it ties in. An andamide 
THC mimics the way anandamide works. So you can uh, bind to the CB1 receptor and get some THC to subsidize what you're missing. But if you don't know this about yourself, this is what happens after a while. You have stressful events. The cortisol stays in your system longer. Uh, it creates a um, uptick in your pH level. So you become more acidic. Your immune system doesn't like the acidity. So it creates an overactive immune response. You're going to start feeling inflammation and pain, usually in your joints, uh, ankles, knees, etc. You're like, oh my God, I need to get a shot uh, for my knee. It hurts. And I need to take Advil all the time. Well, why is it happening? Well, it's happening because your body is too acidic. So what can you do about it? Multiple things. Number one, as I mentioned before, THC can mimic that uh, uh, anandamide that you're missing. However, too much THC for those people can actually set them into more anxiety. So understanding that balance is really important. Also, those terpene profiles. Also, putting good things in your body, more alkaline foods, doing exercise, being mindful. That's the whole way to look at personalized therapeutic and wellness. And that's how you're going to be able to know this about yourself and avoid those adverse events. And now I can talk about uh, CHS. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. It's, there's, there's so many components. It's not just like what we see in the mainstream media or what we're told, you know, by traditional kind of healthcare practices in terms of you know, take this medicine or just exercise. It's, it's a combination of everything, yeah. right? But it even gets more complex when you start to really understand um, our endocannabinoid system and the endogenous right. cannabinoids that our body produces. It's just like a whole new level of understanding, right. you know? Um, how do you, so you're in Pennsylvania, right? Uh, I'm in LA. Or you're in LA. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you having all this knowledge and whatnot, you know, exactly what you're shopping for probably as a consumer. Oh yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious. I always knew, and this is my, this is the thing I'm always trying to biohack myself and figure it out. We're super spoiled in LA. California is like no other place in the world. Uh, it's just an amazing thing because I travel everywhere. Well, used to before COVID and you go in, we're spoiled. We don't know. We go into any single type of thing that you can possibly want in cannabis exists here. And a lot of them are tested. Some of them are not tested, but a lot of them are tested for at least cannabinoids and heavy metals and et cetera. But a lot of states don't know. So we need to do a better job as an industry of letting everybody know, test your flower, mm -hmm. test your tinctures, make sure that you look at those terpenes, et cetera. But yeah, we're, we're definitely spoiled in that. In yeah. <laughs> I just can't wait till, till things change and that starts to happen all throughout the, the States. Um, but yeah, let's talk about cannabis hyper hypermesis syndrome. <clears throat> so here's the thing. Uh, we've, uh, you know, we've had interactions with, uh, several people that experienced, uh, uh, cannabis, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Uh, we also talked to physicians and there's a lot of confusion, as you just mentioned, it could be that it was cyclical vomiting syndrome uh, that's being triggered by some way. It could be a real condition. So the condition is very similar. There is nausea, there's vomiting, there's abdominal pain. The difference I think that we're seeing uh, just from a, an anecdotal standpoint is that uh, capsation, hot baths, is, uh, that alleviates the symptoms and being able to abstain completely. And it's usually found in heavier cannabis users. So somebody has been using heavier uh, for at least a year or so. Uh, our study looked at a cohort of 585 people that took a survey. And we started with a survey. And the survey talked about you know, your, your symptoms and uh, uh, how long you, you consume cannabis for, et cetera. So from there, uh, we had a, uh, a cohort and a control group. So we ran it just like you would do any type of a clinical study. And uh, we, every single person got a DNA kit, an endo DNA kit. Uh, we swabbed everybody or they swabbed themselves. They registered because all the information is completely anonymous. Uh, uh, they just have a, a record associated with their DNA test. And then uh, we got sequenced and we got their results. And the results are, uh, we're, we're publishing those results. So I can't go into the, the real details of that. But the idea is, to find a genetic link between 
the diagnosis, if they've been diagnosed, because the people that are participating in the, in, um, in the group were diagnosed with happiness, and is there a genetic link? So I can tell you, as everything else, it's complicated. Uh, there are multiple pathways, and there is multiple, multiple uh, pathophysiology that's associated with the expression of this condition. So it's not just, here's one gene, we can point to this gene, and this is what it is. There's a series of different markers, but it's interesting and remarkable that we found prevalent in our cohort a genetic predisposition, a genotype pattern that was found in, let's say, 60, 70 percent or even more uh, on some of them of the cohort versus the general population. So this pattern is prevalent to the cohort, but it's very rare in the general population. And that's you know, the, the results and the conclusion that we will be publishing. So what you're saying there at the end sounds like it's, it's, it's a minority, it's a small population that's, that's encountered this CHS. Right. Um, it's not, you know, it's not the majority and it's, there's various markers, not within the genotype, not just kind of one thing that you can point to. And that's what the study will show. Correct. Uh, yeah, correct. It's absolutely a good summary of that. And also things that people are doing in addition to that, they're a similar cohort, then maybe exacerbating that as well. So it's, here's your genotype. I'm also taking things that can express those things uh, that I shouldn't be consuming uh, that are triggering this as well. So it's like you're encountering a perfect storm. So you have the genotype predisposition. You're also doing the things that are triggering each one of these. So it's it, the analogy would be like, uh, you walk in and uh, every single, you have light switches on your wall. And instead of turning on the one light switch to walk in and get what you need, you just turn on every single light switch. So now the house is on, all the light switches are on, the fan is going, uh, the air conditioning is blowing, everything is going on at one time. And that's sort of uh, what we're seeing as uh, a result of the study. It, in addition to all those things happening that could could be a possible kind of trigger right mm -hmm. is is there any um evidence that points to maybe consumption methods like smoking versus eating edibles uh there are some indications of method of consumption for sure yes okay and yeah. there's and there's definitely there's definitely an indication of metabolic function associated with that too and that's where when you get into the gut, for instance, there, that's where there is a similarity between CBS because there's a, there's the vega, there's, there's a connection there that's a triggering mechanism uh, that triggers the expression of, uh, of vomiting as well. So yeah, there, those are the things we're, we're, we're seeing uh, in this study right now. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to ask too much because I know that we got to wait until that study is published. And um, when it does publish, mm -hmm. uh, Len, I'd love to have you back on so we could really dive deep into some of the findings that y'all, y'all get from that. It's, it's yeah. exciting, but I'll tell you, man, this was the most difficult study that I've ever, ever been involved with in my life. And I'll tell you why, because the lack of trust from the CHS community and the amount of inference, I mean, it's like, they're stealing our DNA. This is bullshit. It's not going to work. I'm like, we're under an institutional review board. Here is the protocol. It's not, we're, we have to follow. If we don't follow a certain protocol, we'll be kicked out of the IRB. Right. So this is as stringent as we possibly could get. And I understand. And I do understand because people are desperate and people think that, you know, people want to take advantage of them and make money off them. They're going to sell their DNA. I don't know what people think, but it was a, it is a real struggle. And then we had some advocates within the CHS community that were advocating against us too, that had strong voices. And if you're going into these groups, et cetera, they would, uh, you know, get in a loudspeaker and say, don't do this. This is wrong. And all this stuff. And, and I was really, really surprised because I thought, we're going to do something that's going to, to help. help people. Yeah. And it was a, it was a very difficult that, to understand. That's, that's surprising to me also. Like, do you think their resistance was more geared toward like, like, cause the people that I know, I know that the struggle is, is that they use cannabis in their life, like every day, it's like a lifestyle thing, right? Yeah. Like we talked mm -hmm. about it earlier. So it's this 
kind of caught in the middle of, I don't want to believe that that's what's triggering it, but at the same time, that helps me, you know? So do you think that that was part of the resistance on their end? Or was it the fact that there was that just that, that um, mistrust, which of course wasn't true about what you do with the DNA and all that kind of stuff? I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I've been in some of these groups and I've talked to the monitors of this group and uh, there's a lot of mistrust. Uh, like, well, you know, it seems to us that uh, your data isn't secure, that you're going to take our data. I don't know. I really don't know what it is. I believe that some people, a lot of people in desperation mode, like what they want to do, here's the biggest kicker, because we were offering a complimentary full endodna test as part of this for participating. So what, what happened was they're like, oh, well, they're recommending the best cannabis for you afterwards. And we're told not to consume cannabis. And I'm like, not at all. Uh, this is a DNA test specific for this. But however, we still give you the full end of DNA test. So if ever or whenever you can consume cannabis again, here is the guideline to show you what's best for you. In no way where we're telling people, hey, uh, consume cannabis, we're going to sell you more. more. Can-. That wasn't that wasn't the thing. So you know, look, I, I dealt with people uh, that have different conditions and illnesses, you know, I understand. And I understand that there's desperation. When desperation comes in, you know, the paranoia uh, arises, somebody's trying to get uh, get something from you. That's not the case, but I understand that. And I've been in this industry, you know, for over 27 years. And I'm passionate about helping people with this therapeutic plan. Like, it's my medicine. I want everybody to have a positive experience. And I'm connected personally to people that are from this amazing plant. They're sick and they know they like it, but they can't consume it. So if there's a way that we can help solve this. That's a mission. That's a, so I, I never understood that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I don't either, man. I'm with you. Um, it's wow. And so like, where do we go from here? Like the future of wellness, right? Like yeah. everything that we've talked about, like, that's obviously the future, but, but how do we get there? Like, what's the, mm-hmm. what's the you know, path of least resistance and, and what do we need to do as an industry, as a healthcare system, yeah. policymakers, everything, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot, man. I'm, I'm <laughs> got my crystal ball and I can sit in every single chair right now and policymakers and everything. All right. So let me start with the top down policymakers. So number one, prohibition has never worked in any type of industry ever. So the first thing we need to do is end prohibition. There's no reason for it and it doesn't work. Number two, uh, we need to fund research, global research, so we can all collaborate and work on different things. And there's going to be a path where there's going to be a pharmaceutical path. There's no denying it. It's going to happen. Uh, You know, Jazz uh, bought uh, GW for a reason because they believe in individualized components, which is going to be part of it. So there will be a doctor who's going to prescribe you a cannabinoid treatment. It'll be an isolated cannabinoid treatment, and you'll get that by prescription. There's also going to be a path that's more um, looking like a supplement, a nutraceutical space, because that's the plant pulling it apart and putting it back together to its components. So the way that I envision this working is kind of going back to the compounding pharmacy model in a way, but in, in my hopes and dreams, and that's why we do what we do, is people start with the endocannabinoid system with a DNA test. Uh, they can also look at other biomarkers. So get your blood test, get your plasma, because it's all interconnected. You can see that you have inflammation markers. You can see different things. Uh, plug in and get your suggestion. It's based on that. Then get it all the way down to a, uh, a way that people can buy consistent products no matter where they are in the US or anywhere in the world. Like Kevin's best formulation to sleep is uh, to help him unwind is formulation number one. Whatever that is, that's your formulation. Uh, and you can go anywhere in the world, wherever the dispensary is. Could be a pharmacy, could be some other type of a uh, uh, dispensing methodology, but you can go and get your formula one anywhere in the world. So you have consistency. It's all tested the same way. It's all made the same way. When I get my Advil uh, in the UK, I'll still get the same Advil. There's no difference to it. Uh, And then being able to get that feedback loop. 
So not only having studies, but having efficacy and seeing what's efficacious for different uh, people and different groups of people that we can hone in and make better recommendations for them. And then we'll have better methods of cultivation. We'll have better methods of formulation and we have me better methods of uh, consumption for those individuals. So your health and wellness truly becomes personal. Everything we do, our food that we put in, our, our nutrients, our supplements, because you can see, uh, even using endoDNA, you can see that some people are born with a predisposition to vitamin D deficiency. So if you know this about yourself, you know, speak to your healthcare professional or, you know, consume more vitamin D than the average person. Or look at the drug interactions, all those things, it's being empowered and being empowered in the moment. So you understand what it is that you're taking. You understand that, you know, you're, you, you have to take more steps. Your Fitbit data is connected to it. You have uh, your, your sleep cycle is connected. Uh, everything is connected because your stress that you had when somebody cut you off in traffic can actually affect your sleep, which can affect the inflammation. So now I can't work out because my body hurts. Why does it hurt? Because I was stressed two days ago. So those are the things that you need to have better control of, and we will. We'll have better wearables, we'll have better devices, and people need to start taking better uh, control over their own health and wellness. If COVID taught us one single thing, it's that our healthcare system is not set up for this. It failed us, and, and it didn't. I mean, we're, we're good at acute things. This hurts right here. I'm going to take a shot right here. So this is exactly where it hurts, which is one way, but why does it hurt here? Maybe it started not in my wrist. I'm pointing my wrist for those who can't see. It didn't start in my wrist. Maybe it started in my gut. So I need to look at my gut bacteria. And by the way, my microbiome is different than your microbiome. So all those things empowering ourselves and having a collaborative relationship with a healthcare professional, that's the future. It's being able to be, oh no, no, not cannabis. I can't even look at it. I'm a doctor. No. Your healthcare professional understands we have the system, understands we have phytocannabinoids and collaboratively works with you for a treatment plan that's preventative for chronic issues, not just acute treatment. So that's kind of my, my. Yeah, it <laughs> totally makes sense. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about empowerment for the patient, right? And, and, you know, enabling that, that notion of personalized medicine and, and starting yep. with the endocannabinoid system, like you said, like yep. first figure out where we're at genetically, you know, where our levels are, where we're deficient, what, you know, and then, and then start to, to, you know, supplement our bodies with those cannabinoids and those nutrients and those things that we need. Right. right. Not exactly. the reverse. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I love it, man. It's, it's, it's been such a fascinating conversation, Len. Um, I really, really appreciate all your insights. I know that my audience is really going to uh, enjoy this and get a lot out of it as well. So um, please tell us, where can we find your website, social media, if we want to learn more? Yeah, it's endo, E-N-D-O, D-N-A, endodna.com. Uh, same thing on social and uh, mine is uh, Len May, L-E-N-M-A-Y. It's Len May DNA on uh, Instagram and Twitter and all those other things. And uh, yeah, if, uh, if your audience is so inclined to listen to everything is personal, and then I have a book uh, that's coming out. It's uh, being published now. Uh, I'm grateful to have a publisher. It's called Making Cannabis Personal. And that's going to be stories of something similar to what I talked about, my stories and then stories of individual people, a lot of grandma Mary's and, and soldier Jim and all that stuff. I had these experience. And the reason why I want to, I wanted to write this book is I want people to relate because a lot of people don't talk about their experience. I work with a lot of athletes and veterans and they don't talk about, Oh yeah, I was, I had a panic attack, but it's okay. It's all right. People need to talk about that a little bit more. And that's what the book is about. So people can relate and they can relate to that archetype and have that conversation. I'm so-and-so, I'm, so, I'm so-and-so too. I'm more of a linalool person. I'm more of a limonene person. So that, that's kind of the goal. Making cannabis personal. And can they find that on Amazon or where can they get that book? Uh, it's, not, it? it's not published yet. We did, just did the pre-sale. It just uh, ended. But if anybody wants to like reach out to me, uh, I'll, I'll make sure to get them a, a copy. It'll be, it'll be out. I think it's supposed to be published late spring. So it'll be out in paperback and 
Amazon and Barnes and Noble, Target, wherever you get books. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm definitely going to get a copy. I'm, I might want to sign one though, too. So. All right. Well, we'll see if we can work <laughs> something out. <laughs> right on. Well, thank you so much again, Len. And thank you all for listening. Thank Bye. You. Appreciate it. Thank you.